Good evening. Thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, my name is David Shepherd. I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor here at Canterbury Christchurch, and um, it's um, a great privilege for me to be able to be here uh, and to introduce this evening's event and to express the university's support uh, for uh, this um, event to mark the International uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, it's a very sobering thought that we should need an International Transgender a day, a day of Remembrance, but uh, if you uh, look at some of the resources that are available uh, on the internet around the whole trans uh, agenda, it is really quite shocking to see the up-to-date uh, list of names of individuals who have fallen victim to uh, transphobic uh, violence or to transphobia generally, um, uh, which is precisely the purpose of uh, the, the international events which, uh, which have been taking place. Uh, so as I say, a, extremely uh, sobering and uh, something that emphasizes very much just how important it is that a place such as a university should pause at an appropriate moment and express its support and give people an opportunity to reflect on the implications of, of, of everything uh, surrounding uh, transphobia and the struggles associated with that. Um, the university uh, does its best to show its commitment to supporting uh, trans staff and students. Um, this is something that is very much in line with the values that we have as an institution. Um, I'm sure many people will feel that we can do more, and I think we probably can, and we must work to do even more than we do at the moment. Um, this is an important sector, uh, sector-wide, higher education sector-wide issue. Um, and so in, within that, I think, we, we can probably say that Canterbury Christchurch uh, is um, in the vanguard of, of the sector on, on these matters. Um, but that is not to counsel in any sense any sort of complacency. It is really important that we all continue to work uh, on this. Um, just to give you one example of the way in which we are trying to um, make sure that we are and remain in the vanguard, we are currently uh, submitting to Athena Swan, the Equality Challenge Unit's Athena Swan scheme uh, for accreditation on our, um, our promotion of gender equality. Um, and within that Athena Swan submission, institutional submission, we have included a, a very positive uh, paragraph on our trans policy and our trans inclus inclusivity. Um, and indeed, to a certain extent, we've actually challenged some of the very terms in which the Equalities Challenge, Equality Challenge Unit has articulated the notion of, of, uh, of gender equality because it did not actually make proper provision for the identification of people as trans, um, which is quite ironic, I think. So we have managed to point that out in a gentle and constructive way. Um, and of course, Canterbury Christchurch is also uh, uh, the long-standing home of the uh, Queering Paradigms Network established by Professor B. Shearer, um, which, of course, is devoted to um, the academic critique and questioning of the binaries within which we can so often, in, into which we can so often lapse in talking about issues of gender identity. So this evening's event is in two parts. First, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Shearer, who's going to speak to us. Uh, now and at around 6.15 we will move either to the chapel or weather permitting outside uh, to the fountain uh, for uh, the vigil uh, um, or organised jointly um, with the chaplaincy and of course with um, CCCQ uh, LGBTI uh, Association. So let me just say again uh, how important we feel it is uh, to express our support as an institution for this event and for uh, this day and hand over to Professor Shearer, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, I had originally planned not to be the one standing here, um, so hopefully next year I can arrange an, another face uh, uh, to speak uh, on this uh, occasion, which is personally and professionally a, uh, a difficult day, obviously, uh, for many of us, for myself, for many of us. Um, and I'm delighted to echo what David just said about uh, how this institution has evolved from an institution that 
discussed openly and opposed openly uh, equality in terms of sexual orientation at some point to uh, an institution that now uh, takes a dissident and counter-establishment movement like queer queering paradigms as something to put into their official documents as a as a as something to show how great they are. When we think about these kind of movements of uh, resistance that become part of uh, the discourse, we should also have the warning that the resignation of Sarah Ahmad held for higher edu education and mind, a recog uh, the recognition that the moment where it our equality activism becomes part of uh, equality tokenism, we have failed. So we will always have to be held accountable uh, in our activism. Uh, accountable, obviously, in a sense of uh, legal accountability, but accountable much more to where we become part of the establishment and cover up inequalities through the discourse of equalities, we have failed. I don't think we are at this point in uh, the university here, but we should never try to, to come to this point. Now let me talk today a little bit um, uh, about transphobia as it should, as it as it's, as it's, as it's a rightful place to do. And I'm not talking about the 295 names published by Transrespect because we will honor the individuals in our vigil and many of us in London or yesterday I, I heard also in Canterbury was something here. Uh, we did that in the vigil yesterday and we will do that today. But I talk more about something that we tend to forget that these almost 300 people, so some Breitbart person would say, so what's the big deal? They are transgender people, they are murders, they are 300 murders, so what's the big deal? Where's the statistic relevance in that? Now, you all know that the, the people listed were listed according to stringent criteria where a direct Relate causal relationship could be established between transphobia and their murders. And that is very, very hard, criminologically very, very hard to do. Um, what these murders, as tips of the iceberg, show is something much darker, something that is much more worrying, and that is the ongoing trans systemic failure that trans and gender non-binary people encounter in their negotiation of life, day-to-day -day life. The soul murders, which are delayed murders that express themselves, can they express themselves in suicides, in the development of what then is pathologized as mental health issues, uh, or in unhealthy habits that are also delayed suicides in the underachievement of human potential and uh, that spirals into um, for the few trans people of us who are privileged and are functioning and uh, holding jobs and can pay the bills and even maybe have relationships and friends uh, that keep them alive there are many many of us who do not have share in this privilege and very often as the statistics show us these are uh, doubly and trebly marginalized people people of colors sex workers who make the uh, specifically trans women of colors who work as sex workers who make the are the most vulnerable to direct violence and murder so let me talk now then a little bit about social justice issues around systemic transphobia. 
And on the heart is that what we need to recognize as oppressive normalcy. Um, um, when I talk about oppressive normalcy as a macro mechanism of transphobia, then I mean with that a rather arbitrary choice a society in its development seems to have made to normatize bodies and neuroactivity in such a way that it clashes, as I would hold, actually with the embodied experience and neurodiversity of all people. But some people just can pass and wing it <laughs> and pretend to, to, to be able to claim body normalcy and claim neuro-normalcy or neuro-typicality. Um, when I think about that, I use uh, the um, sociolinguistic theory of Lakoff, who looked at uh, language formation uh, according to prototype, where meaning is essentialized and constructed as an ideal against which The, the, the distance against which is then used to measure to, uh, in order to hierarchize. So in other words, we don't talk about black and whites, we talk about an ideal center that creates margins and that it creates different points of distance from the center. And we all know what the center is. The center is white, male, cis, hetero, young or early middle-aged, able-bodied, wealthy, class, from the right class, neurotypical, whatever good-looking means, and so on. We all have this kind of ideal. Now, the more you deviate from this ideal, not we have it, society con uh, constructs it like that. Now, the, the further you're away from this, the further and uh, the more your position in the social power and participation and social psychosocial power is actually limited. So the center creates this arbitrary center creates the margins, creates objections. And we find that in different uh, aspects, but they are all linked together, they're all intersectional, but we, we isolate them out if we talk about specific uh, aspects. So the binary cisgender center, uh, especially binary cisgender masculinity, creates patriarchism, patriarchal bias, sexism, cisgenderism, transphobia, misogyny. The racial or religious elite constructions, class constructions, create white supremacy, racism, colorism, casteism, any form of religious monopolism. Uh, the compulsory heterosexualities, as we all know, says Adrian, <coughs> uh, is, uh, is creating homo, lesbo, bi, queer, phobia, and so on. And, uh, the list goes on. So you see always that how the center is creating the margins according to an idea that actually literally nobody completely and so completely successfully embodies and experiences. Now if we talk about trans people then the most important in indicator for the social injustice that the center produces through the marginalization of trans existence is the discourse around mental health the particularization itself of trans-dasein, of trans-existence, as something that it has to be put into the DSM as gender dysphoria, is a marker of this marginalization. Although there is hope since the DSM-5, where for the first time there seems to be a shift away from the inherent essentialized pathologization of trans existence to actually the experience of systemic transphobia as the cause for suffering. 
but still the whole term gender dysphoria is still being used and that's the whole still di the discourse of popularization is um, is still um, used in healthcare um, and pragmatically you could say well essential uh, you know pragmatic strategic essentialism we just do that in order to give, get uh, get uh, uh, help and support. Okay, so there are different discourses you could take, but uh, with the DSM-5, a rather, you know, conservative uh, medical background, uh, acknowledging that their trans mental health issues are the direct result of oppressive knowledge and transphobia. And um, when you do a meta-analysis of servers from the global north, then you come so to some very striking results. Now I want to look at, at trans mental health or transphobia as it inscribes itself on the trans body under these uh, headings, depression, suicide attempts, suicides, self-harm, drug usage, and reports of direct discrimination and violence in different spheres. And if we go through the different lemata, we, we find horrendous ciphers, horrendous numbers, uh, only from the privileged position of the global north that has started to doing these surveys. Now, the uh, methodology of these surveys are not uh, always compatible. I have to gloss over all this. There's a lot of things that you need to, uh, from a sociology point of view, would need to um, be a little bit more careful about it, that you don't compare pears and apples. But the trends in the different uh, uh, surveys is actually completely compelling. Uh, the high prevalent of diagnosed depressions, the incredible prevalence of suicidality, be that in through attempts and also through actual suicide rates, um, is um, and then the prevalence, especially on the, among trans youths, um, arguably one of the most vulnerable groups um, uh, among. In the trans communities. Self harm, anywhere between uh, half to two thirds of people uh, self harming, especially under uh, 20, so, uh, under uh, uh, youth. Um, thinking of suicide as compared to the heterosexual or cisgendered comparison group. So it's a double to triple prevalence of suicidal thoughts. Now, suicidal thoughts is a very good marker of uh, mental health struggle. Um, so uh, I don't want to go through all this. This needs to be talked through a little bit more um, with a more commentary, but I would just give you a an impression of how just systemic problems and obstacles and distress is for trans folks. Um, yeah, drug use is actually well. There's, there's you can, there is some contradictory evidence, but anyway. Um, now. Obviously, negotiating day-to-day -day life can be extremely difficult if you are either defi defining yourself as a trans person who is on a journey uh, within a binary structure, structure or as a trans person who is outside the binary structures. Because uh, there's a whole negotiation of personal safety, attempt, failure and success of what is called passing, uh, but also desirability of passing, that's another thing. 
And this is extremely obvious in the dealing with health service, but there's nowhere else in the, than in the, in the, in the when, you, when, when you need help in your health. Is, are you that vulnerable to be binarized and to be put into a, a label that is, uh, that can, it can be very uh, distressful? So how dealing with health uh, service is, uh, is marked by discrimination, uh, the, the experience of discrimination. Um, as is experience in school and work, especially uh, for, for young people, as, as you know. Um, now, probably you all know that, you all know about, uh, because uh, whether you're trans or not, you, you might have been at the wrong right or wrong side of bullies yourself and uh, had your traumatic experience. Um, what is interesting in the, sum in the surveys that actually differentiate between, uh, uh, between trans and cis students is, is the, uh, the uh, uh, quantity of the, uh, and the extreme of the abuse being occurred. Um, and that links obviously to questions of personal resilience and robustness or lack thereof. You know, and that is, we see direct links occurring hence between school and work, discrimination uh, and the other features to uh, depression, other coping strategies up to suicide. Now, work, again, we are at an institution that is, has became, came to the forefront of the HE sector when in 2010 uh, the ED manager uh, together with me wrote a trans policy, to my knowledge the first in any higher education uh, establishment. Uh, that is not the normal experience for trans people, right? Trans, trans people in the, in the workforce are usually even uh, are, are experience an incredible amount of uh, difficult negotiations about their privacy, about their uh, uh, whether they come out, how they come out, how they transition, and so on. And we see these in these ci ciphers, in these numbers. I don't know why I keep calling to Dutch. I do apologize. Ciphers in Dutch is numbers. So if I say it again, it's numbers. Okay. <laughs> Um, and there's a direct correlation to poverty. One of the most striking things I want to comment is from the Canadian study is that although there is an indication that there is an, among the trans populace a higher level of higher university degrees, there is still a, a, a an, an staggering amount of people who, wor who are living on uh, in poverty under the uh, the minimum income. So that's that doesn't up add up. It doesn't add up. Add up. Um, and we have to be uh, be aware of that. That not everybody is so lucky to to be a lecturer here or a professor or a have a good job in, in a professional service somewhere. Yeah. So it's um, uh, it's not uh, it's not a given. Family obviously broken down relationships with biological families, the relationships break down. Everybody who is trans and who is working through a relationship during transition or non-transition knows what this entails, how difficult that is, what what kind of problems that arises. Not everybody is. Uh, like I loved you with whatever identity we started and uh, now I keep loving you. No, not ever, everybody is so flexible, obviously. Um, 
outright rejections uh, in uh, continental Europe. We're not talking about fundamentalist uh, Midwest uh, America. I'm talking about continental Europe. Even their family rejections, where well there's family rejections for for gay and lesbian teens is not that high. For trans teens is, uh, is extremely high still. Um, and obviously, the, that that makes you especially vulnerable to IPF, to intimate partner violence, uh, because you don't have such a huge network or, uh, to draw from. And uh, so you can uh, be in the, uh, into a spiral of domestic abuse and violence. And there we also see staggering figures of IPF uh, experienced by trans persons. And, uh, and that is obviously on top of the uh, societal experience of violence. Now, what do we learn with that? If anybody would have a doubt why we have this day, why we have a trans policy, a gender identity policy, why we have a T in LGB, then these statistics should give us enough ammunition. No. I was, in 2013, I, I think, I was at a workshop at this university um, where somebody from, even from my faculty, arts and humanities, we are always seen as the, the leftist weirdos, you know, but um, uh, even questioned why we would need to talk about trans. Why do they have to do their own policy? Why do they have to have their own protections? Like, here's why. Here's why. You know? We don't celebrate cis male day because every day is cis male day. <laughs> right? We com don't commemorate uh, cis male people because they are in the center anyway. You know? So here's wha what you get. That's what the statistics tell us. Now, when all this is said and done, what remains is us reflecting on what is not expressed in the numbers. And that is the system, the mechanics that I talked about in the beginning. And this has to do with what feminism has identified as oppressive patriarchy and what we should modify, modify as oppressive heteropatriarchy. In other words, the idea of the Lacoste center and who is in the center. And I don't need to remind you how that works. But I, I will do anyway in a second. <laughs> but we can. But how we, how we think about it. This the production of hegemonic masculinity and heteropatriarchy. This phallocracy is sometimes in feminist writing something that, uh, what I've called a uh, that produces, uh, that is necessary for the production of hegemonic and oppressive masculinity. Now, this you can agree with, disagree with, and you can read it in my publication, so we don't need to dwell on it. But what is really important and interesting behind this is that oppressive heteropatriarchy drives on two very simple steps. Very, very simple. So if you ever need to explain it to, to anybody, it's as simple as explaining the world to Donald Trump. Although I would think he, he probably <laughs> wouldn't agree with me. It has just two simple steps. First of all, the world, the human lexicon, is binary. There's male and there's female. There's blue, there's pink, there's ones, there's zeros. That's it. That's the first step. 
You have to accept that. Biology tell, tells us different because we have intersex people, we have um, psychology t tells us different, but you know, it's so simple. We just make it something with a willy is male and something with a vagina is female. And that's it. Very simple. And then the second step is even more insidious in its pseudo logics. It is that out of these two options, male is the better one. So this is so completely ridiculous, if you look at this, it's so completely, it's uh, almost as uh, ridiculous as most of belief systems. Sorry, Jerry. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you have to understand, you know, you can, uh, if, if, if you're not grown up with, 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 with dying gods and all this stuff, then Christianity looks a bit weird, yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it is uh, completely ridiculous, but it's insidious because the, of the tradition of power it implies. It brings a whole part of humanity into a posi direct position of power above another. Since it's not a natural state, this power has always been struggled for. That is why oppressive masculinity is never something that is fixed. You can never relax into oppressive masculinity. It's never something that is there. It's always something that has to be expressed, something that has to be performed, something that has to be achieved. This is why it's so vulnerable. Yeah. And this is why it has to reassert itself again and again. And on this, in this core, you find things that don't chime well. And that is, for instance, women saying, well, wait a minute, why is male better than female? Yeah. And then you have to develop misogyny, obviously, and sexism. Or you have uh, linkage to uh, domineerance and, uh, and uh, procreatism and uh, compulsory heterosexuality, and then you develop homophobia. But what I argue is, in all these aphalophobic mechanisms to reassert oppressive masculinity, the most insidious one is transphobia because the very existence of trans people and gender non-binary people is an insult to the very core of heteropatriarchal power. So the fragile masculinity sees... Oh, I basically said all this. <laughs> uh, sees trans stars... I know, uh, uh, those of you who know my writings know that I use surprisingly not Deleuze, but Heidegger in my philosophizing of trans existence. So I think Heidegger works really, really well. Anyway, so trans Dasein is an assault to heteropatriarchy because male to female trans symbol signifies in Laconian term the, lo the loss of the fathers, and that is the social cycle privilege of uh, hegemonic uh, masculinity, or in the terms, in the case of FTM, the usurpation of the fathers. So it's always there is a, an unwanted transgressions of this neat and clear hierarchies and binaries. And then what we, uh, in the case of uh, non-binary people, the act of subversion and anarchy in an ostensibly indifference towards the fathers. So I argue that trans, both philosophically and embodied, is the most nucleolic threat to orthodox masculinity, triggering, an, triggering its innate instability and its innate need to constantly reassert itself. And if you want to be really Sounds really clever, which is the way that I got my professorship. <laughs> um, then you can also say trans invades heterophallic dynamoscapes as an ontological threat. 
So, but we won't dwell on that further because <laughs> it's actually ex exactly what I've seen say, said in easier terms before. Now, the other thing that is really, really sad, and we see that, that in LGBT communities, um, whether that's in the in staff networks or in activist networks, uh, in the wider community, is, is what we could call fragmentization. Heteropatriarchy thrives because, also because of the fragmentations of those who are suffering of it. So there are those gay, very often middle class white gay men, who don't want anything else but have same sex marriage, have 1.6 kids and a white picket fence tokens of homonormativity. They don't like trans people. It's uh, because they just want to get in there, into the center. The race for the center, rather than <laughs> blowing up the center that creates the mass, and they just want to get in there. There are trans people who make transnormative claims of what it is to be a trans woman or a trans man. Can you be a trans woman before you have your surgery? Can you be trans when you're when you are non-binary or gender queer, that is what you could call transnormativity. And again, hierarchies are made and allies are fragmented. And the most insidious one, it think, I think, is TERF. People who call themselves feminists, but TERF stands for trans-exclusive radical feminism. But C actually the existence of trans people, especially trans women, as an insult or an onslaught towards or onto female privilege, especially lesbian privilege. And what is born to be a woman with a Y, a, net, a born, a biological born woman and so on. Now, so Heteropatriarchy is really, really happy with all that. It's happy with all the idiot campaigners who, who think that the LGBT rights have won once we get marriage equality. What a disaster to think, you know? What has marriage equality to give to the uh, trans sex worker who is murdered? Nothing, you know? Now, heteropatriarchy is saying, hmm, we can use homonormativity, we can use transnormativity, we can use feminist uh, transphobia, we have a fragmented allyship, and we win. You know, it's a little bit like people who didn't vote want to vote for Hillary. You know, didn't vote, or voted for a third party candidate, you know. Then you win. Divide et impera, as they say in Latin. Now, so what we need to do is, is to challenge that. We need to unite. It's not about ego. It's not about who is the best activist, who shouts the loudest, and who is the best LGBT, or the most victimized. It's about uniting. What is the really at stake? What is the real enemy? Yeah. The real enemy is heteropatriarchy. And so if we look at trans and trans mental health from a social justice perspective, then what we need to fight for is the acceptance of variability. Body variability, neuro variability, gender variability, sexuality variability, and so on. And challenge the pathologization of variable embodiment. And by doing so, and here you can then work with, uh, if you want, with Deleuze, with somatically deconstructing power and putting a rhizomatic alternative in place. So celebrating human embodiment with no center, no margin. When you blow up the center, when you, when you or in other words, when you when you simply reject the creation of a center, refuse a center being created, you also get rid of the margin. 
You don't, you don't put anybody in the center. You don't put anybody in the margin. On that, you can do by educating and embracing variable forms of being human, simply human. And what Chris Mounts said in his take on critical disability studies in his formula that he take, took over from Homo Barba in a different way, a sameness in difference. So, my proposal here would be the radical acceptance of human variability as that what transforms all our distress and struggles and creates a societal environment where variable embodiment is celebrated not as and not feared as a symbol for um, the projection of ontological insecurity in Giddens' talk. Righty ho, so let's so this this is where I would hope we can go and we can live that. We have I think we have to live that. The murder and the soul murder and the people we lost, the friends we lost, the uh, the strangers we lost, life potentials curtailed and lives quenched. All these scream to us with all their that with all what we can in any moment to put a, put aside our egos, put aside our divisions, keep an eye on the real enemy, heteropatriarchy, and work together. Then I think honoring those we lost like that is that is the real honoring. We don't want to do memorizing as it's done in some cultures, including British culture, where we memorize not to remember, but we memorize to forget. You know, people wearing a poppy once a year, not because they want to remember, they want to forget. It's tokenism. We don't want this as a tokenism. So the litmus test is in our daily life. Will we come together and challenge heteropatriarchy? Will we make Helen, David, will we make sure that this university does not succumb to a rhetoric of equality in the service of late capitalist neoliberalism, but that we take equality serious, so serious that we actually do believe it and work for it. Um, no matter whether we have nice and shiny policies, not the policies that will survive, but it's people that will or will not survive. Yeah. So to, to come together as this community. I, so I really hope, uh, with all of the flaws I have and all the failure I ha certainly have personally, I hope that somehow we can come together and try that. Not just now when we go and hold our candles, but but for the for the years to come. Thank you very much. <coughs>